Three, the last occasion when we three uh, met was in Dublin at the airport when we were then driven to the hotel. And I know that the person that drove us is actually watching. Gavin, it's nice to see you again. Uh, yes, we survived that trip. It was okay. I, <laughs> I, I think you were jet lagged, uh, PZ, because that was the most frightening car drive I've ever had. And what the the only blessing of it was the second time he mounted the curb, the car came to a halt, so I could get, actually get out. What is your <laughs> recollection of that journey? It wasn't that bad, but then I've driven in Boston, so you know, it was pretty tame. Yeah, I just heard yesterday that uh, that same driver that drove me around Dublin uh, is going to be driving me around Germany. Okay. But he's going to be on the other side of the road then. <laughs> I have to say that w the one thing that made me giggle most is, and I can, uh, to a degree I can understand it, you know, the, the steering wheel is on the other side of the car and everything. But every time he went to change gear, he opened, his, he opened the door. <laughs> so, what are you doing? <laughs> hey, I had to do that too. I had an opportunity to drive what I thought was one of the, 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 the best uh, American cars ever made. I had a chance to drive a 1958 Chevy Corvette, uh, you know, white on red paint job, and it was absolutely beautiful. But the problem is, the 58 Corvette is made for little people, women, I think. Uh, um, in order to hit in or fourth, I had to turn my elbow like this because you have this little wooden panel back there. And in order to release the clutch, I had to open the door to let my knee out because I had to sit sort of in, a, in an Indian-style position, as they would say, under the dashboard. Had to let my knee out by opening the door. So it was, uh, yeah, not, not a worthwhile experience. Beautiful car to look at, not worth keeping. PZ, what have you been up to recently? Um, I know, obviously, you're always very busy lecturing and uh, touring. Yeah. Um, have you got any interesting stories to tell us about? No. <laughs> okay. In that case, it's been, uh, it's been you're teaching done. and grant writing lately, and that's it. Just grinding away. Uh, and then grinding away in Minnesota is not the best place to grind, I guess. Um, oh, it's not bad. It hasn't started snowing yet. That's that's next month. <laughs> next month is when it gets cold. No wonder you like to travel so much. Um, <laughs> I had I, I feel so awkward and embarrassed about this because for, for um, everyone I did sort of like had things planned that I was going to talk about and I had intended to look on for Angular to see what you'd posted about recently so I could sort of like have some segue into an interesting conversation but I have spent such a long time over the last six hours trying to figure out how Skype or why Skype is not working um, I, I haven't had an opportunity to do so and I feel really awkward uh, Aaron. It's, this what? is the time for you to step up to the mark. I don't know what's wrong with Skype. No. Generate <laughs> interesting <laughs> conversation. Uh, yeah, Jesus. say something interesting so I can respond. That's, that's oh, okay. our way for it. Okay. Uh, well, I try, I try not to talk up on you too much. I did that once on the nonprofit show. Uh, after we met in Dublin, I was very impressed with you because it was very confrontational on our first meeting. And I was impressed that not only that you, you stood up to me without hesitation or uh, without, without the slightest intimidation whatsoever, but also uh, spoke in a very caustic manner immediately. It was the same thing when, when that uh, barrage of uh, Islamist extremists cornered you with the microphone saying, why do you hate Muslims? And it, I, I thought your immediate reaction to that was excellent, too. I mean, um, for somebody that doesn't look like he could take people out in a fight, I was very impressed with with, with your gut. Just the, the the way that you you, know, you don't get intimidated, you don't get riled at all, and I have to admire that. Dan, I, I was. Think, uh, I think, if I may, the, the the way in which he just you know with such a delft hand just chopped uh, hands or so uh, uh, <laughs> uh, away at the knees, and it was just one comment. Um, I think the question was, what have you got? What problem have you got with Islam? And the response it's was, it's just stupid. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's it. But he, he had no comeback to it. I thought it was wonderful. 
Now, I have to tell you that I have been accused, I have been accused of endangering the people around me by attracting Muslim terrorists chasing me from Europe. And this is how paranoid people in the United States are. And I, and I can't go into all the details about it, but it, it's just enormously laughable to me that, I, that, that what we encountered, which is all over the Internet, anybody can see it, and the guy was on our show, and we handed him his ass. I mean, how did, does that look like anybody's hunting me? I mean, it, it, it's so ridiculous how paranoid people are in this country. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I've, I've, had, I've had very little problem with Muslims in this country. That's... But then, you know, to, to be honest with you, I haven't had much trouble with Christians either. That uh, they they have a a habit of talking big and and threatening me on in email and so forth. Uh, but it's it's never been a real problem. It's not. Has there ever, ever been any threat that um, you have sort of like been concerned about? Oh, there there have been a few very specific very personal threats to me and my universities for instance that that you know I, I I don't feel like I have to worry about them too much but you still have to be sensible and you know especially when it's anything that might involve students or my family I, I mean that's one of the difficulties because obviously um given the nature of your job because you have to be contactable you have to have certain information posted and everything um right I, I, but on the other hand i do so live I in Morris, minnesota it so it's not so much of a worry mm. um somebody has just posted me a question um that they were hoping that i would ask you and it reads as follows uh, could you ask him if he is going to review the paper that those Muslims, and I think um, knowing who it is, he's referring to the ones in uh, Dublin, are uh, about to release regarding the Quran embryology miracle. Also, what went through his mind when he told Adnam uh, that bones don't come before flesh, and he replied, well, even if that's true, the Quran is still correct. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, I, I'm sure you do. Uh, I, I, I th if, for those that are not aware of it, um, these uh, Muslims were basically being somewhat aggressive towards um, PZ uh, outside the hotel in uh, Dublin, and they were saying, "Oh, well, you know, uh, the Quran has got all this wonderful scientific foreknowledge," and they were talking about the development of the embryo, in which they specifically, quite specifically, said the bones came first and then the flesh. And when they found out that PZ was actually not too shabby on his embryology, um, <laughs> they got a little bit hesitant. And when uh, PZ said to them, um, well, is that what the Quran says, that the bones come before the flesh? This absolutely, yes, definitely. And PZ said to them, well, in that case, the Quran is wrong because they happen simultaneously. And they said, ah, oh, yes. But that word can also mean simultaneous. So the Quran is slicked. How can you argue with people like that? Yes, they're irrefutable. <laughs> um, no, but so the, the, they, they did threaten to send me that paper that they've written. Um, something happened, though. Uh, so here's the thing. You know, they, they actually seemed quite flattered with the fact that I engaged them in Dublin. And... They were, they were very enthusiastic about this, and I actually talked to them. They thought this was a great vindication of their position, even though I disagreed with everything they said, said that, that Islam was stupid. But, you know, still I talked to them. Um, well, of course and, you talked to them. They showed up with a movie camera and cornered you against a wall. Where did they expect you to go? There was eight I, of them. I was just about to add that as well. You engaged yeah. with them. No, you were cornered. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, so, then, so they, and then they, they wanted to whisk him away to another secured location where he could not escape. Remember that? <laughs> they wanted him to come to some private conference where they would take care of his transportation so that he can't get out, and then they could surround him and bombard him with their with their you know apologetics nonsense. And again, until it's, it's, it, I, I, PZ, it's, it's awful. We're, we're sort of like you're you're the main star, and we're like talking about you as if you're not here. But again, it was a wonderful example of the way in which PZ could just absolutely annihilate someone. 
because I said, you know, come to this debate in London and everything. And Peter just looked at him and said, to talk about what? <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, well, they, they, they did send me multiple invitations to multiple debates. And they've been trying to drag me out. But as I was saying, what happened is um, I have disenchanted them. They have gotten very unhappy with me. Uh, when I was in Oslo for the uh, the International Humanist Convention, they they set up a booth outside the Oslo Center too, and they were haranguing people. And one of the this things is they Hamza were, again. Yes, he actually came out to Oslo and was right there. They had a little tent out there. It was very dramatic. Um, and what happened is that they were constantly bombarding the Twitter feed for the conference. They were constantly bringing up this stuff. Like they mentioned that they, you know, they were bragging about converting somebody and so forth. It was it was totally inappropriate. And I made some comment on Twitter to say, okay, stop it, go away, just shut up. We don't you're 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 not wanted here. We don't want to listen to you. And they just got very indignant that I was compromising freedom of speech and they got very upset with me. Um, and, and Wait, they said, but I want to clarify. This is Hamza, the, the, the guy who speaks against the freedom of speech, is upset yes. at, is upset at yes. you. For, this is the same guy who went to a country that does not have a separation of church and state, that is a Christian country, and he's proposing Muslim tenets at an atheist convention in a Christian country where they have a blasphemy law, and he's complaining about freedom yes. of speech, that, that he's, he's against freedom of speech. Right. But he's only for it if you're using it against him. Yes, and, and unbelievable somehow, hypocrisy. This this offended them deeply because they no longer send me email. They're not inviting me to any of these debates anymore, <laughs> and they didn't send me that paper on embryology. So, what can I say? I have to say, um, I think it was a couple of weeks after Dublin, uh, Hamza appeared on the Magic Sandwich show, and there were various uh, statements that he um, made during the course of that program, which are, if people think I'm misquoting, they're available on YouTube, um, they've not been sharply edited or anything, which included comments like, you know, the um, uh, beheading of homosexuals um, was justified to a degree, I'm not saying, you're saying it was justified entirely, but it was justified to a degree because uh, beheading is painless. <laughs> well, yeah, that was, that was the humane way, and I don't think he was talking about homosexuals, he was either talking about uh, uh, infidels or apostates, it was one of those two, I, I think, I, I could uh -huh. be wrong in my memory, but mm. that's okay. the way I remember it. And of course, that's when the gloves came off, that's when there was no more attempt at civility. Right, yes, well... He's, he's uh, kind my, of... my, my, sorry, my point that I was going to go on to make that he, their organization is a registered charity. Yeah. Which means they get tax exemption. I think it was it 501 in America or something like that. You know, so much stuff. Right? So, yes. Yeah. So this bloke is traveling around to Dublin, to Oslo, or whatever, uh, on tax-free money. With a movie spread. camera, yeah, uh -huh. and, to spread. And, a, and, and a band of troops in Armani suits. Absolute nonsense. And part of, I, I, I looked into this prior to the show. Part of the um, basis of, of them getting charitable status is that they do research. So I clicked on their research page on their website, and I kid you not, it came up with a blank page. <laughs> totally blank. Um, I, I searched around a bit more, and I eventually found that they had done a. Uh, this is research. They'd done a London bus campaign, which I think was putting posters on buses, and they'd also done um, a um, poll of 500 people asking them, you know, what their views of Muslims were. Okay. Well, In two years. That yeah. is the extent of their research. For, for them to even purport that they have produced a paper, as in a scientific paper, it's going to be an absolute joke, I can assure you. Right. Oh, well, yeah. I, I, uh, somebody actually sent me a critique of the embryology paper that they're supposedly putting together, and it is pretty silly. It's more of the same, you know, 
retroactive fitting of the data to contemporary science and uh, total nonsense, not worth not worth digging into. I mean, I, I presume they're trying to still sort of like use the argument that the Quran contains information that couldn't possibly be known. I, I mean, I presume yes. that's where they're coming from. Yes. As a matter of interest, um, this is something I was uh, considering uh, in the last couple of days, and I, I know it's somewhat heavy, and I know that the explanation is probably going to be quite difficult, but it, it's curious to me, when um, an embryo forms, the uh, cells start dividing and multiplying and in the early stages those cells are so far as I understand identical and it's only yes. after a certain time that some of them then somehow realize I've got to turn into a liver protein and I've got to turn into an eye bit right. and I've got to what extent do we understand how that process happens Oh, you you asked a hard question. <laughs> but we, we, we know it very well for some things. Um, you know what it is is you've got to you've got to you've got to break it down into the signal transduction events that that triggered cells to change their patterns, and then you have to break it down further into what genes are activated or repressed in response to those signals. And we know part of the answer for lots of things. So you know it's it's. It's it's one of these things. Uh, for instance, in stem cell research, this is one of the things they try to figure out: is um, what kinds of chemical agents can we place in a dish full of totipotent stem cells that will induce them to be a liver or a kidney or a piece of lung or whatever? Um, and and we're slowly working those bits and pieces out. But yeah, it's generally a well. I, I'm grateful that you didn't uh, bitch slap me as I was uh, bitch slapped by Lawrence Krauss and uh, Eugenie Scott earlier on in the show. I mean, I, I, I do think it's an interesting question, and I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for an honest answer that, to a degree, we don't fully understand it. Um, hey, why, why, why do they bitch? Did you ask them the same question? Lawrence Krauss told him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> As if I talk too much. <laughs> Man, he's mean. Okay. Yeah, Cindy, I got a question for you as well. As somebody else uh, in the chat had brought this up, and and it, it is a kind of question I'm I'm curious about. Earlier on, when I was talking to Barbara Forrest, we were talking about teachers in Texas and in Louisiana who are supposed to be teaching science, but who use that as an agenda to present their their socio political religious views to the students. Conversely, you, as being one of the most outspoken evolutionary biologists in the country, or if, indeed the world, I'm sure that in the state that you're in, you had to have a few creationist students. Oh, yeah. And do you have any interesting uh, confrontations yeah. about that? Um, yeah. There's lots of creationist students here. This is... Uh I actually have a colleague at the Twin Cities at the University of Minnesota campus there who's for a number of years been doing these studies where he looks at the incoming freshmen and asks them questions about evolution and what did you learn in high school and all this. And um, it, it's kind of chilling, actually, that when you look at the actual numbers, about 30% of our high school students get taught something about evolution. That's it, 30%. Um, and this is one of the key concepts in our state science standards. So all of the teachers are supposed to teach this subject. And what's happening is a lot of students are coming out of high school and they're reporting to us, no, nope, we didn't get that. In fact, we got creationism taught at us. So that's happening all the time. Teachers are ignoring the state science standards. Um, well, in my, in my class, you heard. Oh, I, don't you, I, don't, I don't know if you heard. I, I mentioned something about this. At the Texas Freedom uh, Convention or the Texas uh, Free Thought Convention last year, my son reported in his biology class that they had given him a textbook uh, that was listing beneficial mutations, and the teacher was not telling the students to look in the textbook. He was telling the students that there has never been a beneficial mutation, and my son is calling attention to the fact that they're listed in the <laughs> in the textbook, and he was reprimanded for that. Now, I wanted to make this guy famous, but my son's mother insisted that I let him be until he was out of the school system. 
And this uh, is, it has to be what I think you're talking about and what yes. our government, our governor is talking about when he says that they teach both evolution and creationism in school. They're obviously teaching creationism underhanded. That's right. It's, it's kind of a, there's a, there's a one-way ratchet operating here, that if, if you teach evolution in the science classrooms like you're supposed to, um, you get no praise for it. The parents will either ignore or they will protest the administrators that you're teaching ungodly stuff to their kids. Whereas if you teach creationism, um, it's, it's, it's like your son's mother. They say, okay, this is horrible. I'm going to not do anything about it. I'm just going to get my kid out of this program and move them on. And, and then these teachers persist and they can keep going forever and ever. We've got us, uh, our, at our local high school, we've got two, sci two biology teachers, and one of them is a creationist, and she's a self-professed creationist. She's quite proud of the fact <coughs> that she doesn't teach that evolution crap in her classroom. And there's nothing we can do about this, because um, as somebody who does not have a, a child in that classroom, I have no standing to complain. And there's a little bit of self-selection going on right now and that um, parents of children entering that grade who know anything about science will not put their child in that classroom. They'll put them in the other biology teacher's classroom, right? So that means the creationist teacher gets a free pass. None of the students in her class will complain. They don't care. So it's a self-perpetuating problem. It just keeps going and going. Well, if anybody, if anybody listening is aware of teachers teaching creationism or misrepresenting science, uh, do as one concerned teacher or one concerned parent did with me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, notify me, and I will take steps to make sure that that is what is happening and make sure that appropriate action is taken because of it. Yeah. It, it does take, however, a parent of a child in a creationist teacher's classroom to have any kind of legal standing in order to get anything done. And that's a huge limitation. It, make, it makes it really hard to make any progress against these people. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, PC, I was uh, sent a message, I, and I, um, I, I have no idea where this comes from. Um, or whether it's an issue that you would like to talk about, but the message was, could you ask PZ about his um, stalker Mabus? Does that mean? Oh, David Mabus, yeah, Dennis what, what, What's that all about? You don't know? Haven't you been getting harassed by this guy? I, I, oh. I haven't. I get harassed by a lot of people, but yeah, you know, no. after <laughs> the, you know, trounced mm -hmm. by Krauss and uh, Scott, you know, Mabus would be a... Right. In material. No, tell us about Mabus, because I, I, I Okay, have his real name is Dennis Marcuse. He's, uh, he was a student in Montreal um, in the early 90s, and at that time he was a fairly normal person, in that he was a typical tech-obsessed kind of geeky guy who spent a lot of time on Usenet. We didn't have the World Wide Web then yet. It was all use, Usenet. Um, but he became very irate about something. That is, he applied to James Randi for his million-dollar prize on the basis of Nostradamus's predictions. Okay, I don't quite understand this. You would think if if that were true, then Nostradamus ought to get the million dollars, not Dennis Marcuse. But anyway, he's very upset about this, and he turned into this ranting crank on Usenet. And so he's been, so it's been since 1993, he has been harassing various individuals. Um, initially, it was all, you know, I constantly get this email saying, oh, Randy owes me a million dollars, go put pressure on him. And then it, he progressively got worse and worse, and then it became daily exercises in rambling nonsense that he would send out to a large crowd of people. So, yeah, I was getting 20 to 50 emails a day from him. Uh, some of his email, he would cross-post to every single faculty member at the University of Minnesota Morris. Uh, he, he discovered Twitter, and it got to be kind of a joke for a while that if, if anybody said anything to me and if I replied to them on Twitter, shortly thereafter, Dennis Marcuse would charge in with a bunch of 
raving nonsense about he's going to chop your head off. Um, but then last month, uh, finally, a number of us had complained to the police enough. Um, basically, we took over their their Twitter server and bombarded them with all kinds of messages. Uh, they finally took steps and they had him institutionalized for an examination to see if he's insane or not. Which, interestingly, he should have gotten out either t today or yesterday. And I haven't heard anything about what's happened to, to him yet. He was going to be locked up for a month for evaluation purposes, and something's been done with him since. I don't know. <laughs> Once upon a time, uh, PZ Myers and I were both, as he said on Usenet, we were both contributors to a, web, uh, a, a Usenet group, a news group called Talk.Origins. And one of the, the crackpots that kept contributing to there uh, since around the same period of time was one Ed Conrad, who was a coal oh, miner. Oh, yes. <laughs> who was a coal miner who was convinced that, you know how you have young Earth creationists who find any reason that, that, that they can to argue that the Earth is only 6,000 years old? Well, Ed Conrad was trying to argue that, that humans had been in their current condition unevolved for 220 million years. He's a completely yes. different brand of creationist, and he would find anthracite, uh, uh, I can't even remember how to pronounce that, but yet he found coal in confusing sorts of configurations, and he would, he would post pictures of these, which you can't very clearly examine, and he, he would think that they looked like you know, hammers or footprints or what have you. And I just, uh, I, I got a comment posted from him uh, a month or so ago, and I couldn't believe that this guy is still alive, wow. much less still out there, still peddling the same crap. I just wanted to call that up to you. Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah, cobble your memory a little bit. Oh, yeah, no, uh, I actually had Ed Conrad visit my lab. <laughs> we, we, we had some correspondence, and he said, yeah, I've got these bones, and he says, oh, they've got all the internal structure bones, they've got Haversian canals, they've got lamellae, they've got everything. And and so I told him, sure, okay, bring him on down to the lab, and we'll take a look at him. We'll take photographs on my microscope. I know I have a nice research scope, and so I said, you know, we can do all this stuff. And he actually showed up one day at my lab, and um, we put his specimens on the scope. And no, they didn't look anything like bone. You know, I had all these. I had, you know, I had prepared ahead of time. I had all these bone samples, real bone, all on slides, all ready to go. We look at them. He bring in his bone, his his rocks, and we look at them, and he just looks so baffled. He said, no, "They don't look anything like that." He couldn't understand what was going on. It was it was just you know I was I thought I was starting to sink into him that there was a a problem here, and but no, it, it didn't. Of course, the other the other thing, uh, while he was there, you know, he came with all these bones, and he he showed me his secret specimens. He had some spectacular rocks. One was um, apparently his his this this person from a couple hundred million years ago had gotten blown to bits in a catastrophe, and so there were fragments of him all over him, like kidneys and liver. And he pulled out of his pocket his prize, which was coal man's penis. <laughs> and it was it was it was good sized. It was a pretty good sized lump of, of cylindrical rock. Um, but you know, perfectly. Now preserved. there's an inanimate carbon rod. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then he also had his testicles. You know, all these bits and pieces. It's just baffling. Um, you know, it, 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 he, he he described it as that this person had obviously met some tremendous disaster that just blew them to pieces and scattered them all over the place. Which, you know, if, if you imagine a human being being blown up in a bomb nowadays, you wouldn't expect to find nice, discreet things like a perfectly preserved erect penis and a pair of testicles and, and uh, but, yeah. Oh, this looks just like a pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, he had a kidney. He had a brain, and all oh, the the cool thing about the brain is it was smaller than the penis. <laughs> well, he said, is, that's "Isn't that always the case?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking of penises and brains, uh, I'd like to introduce to the show uh, for the first time. He'll be back later, but um, Xavier Lumens, otherwise known as Thunderfoot, welcome to the show, Thunderfoot. Hello there. 
Hey, hey. It's time for you to say something. Yeah, All right. You sent me a so, message um, saying I want to come on because I want to say something. <laughs> the last occasion. Reason their position on academic freedom is by appointment only. <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't let us in the door. And, um, yeah, we decided not to troll them for the... Uh, I don't think Ashley wanted to burn bridges quite yet. I, I, I was all up for it, but... Uh, you should have um, asked for Casey Luskin by name or something. Actually, that would have been a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, what We've I, seen this think, guy on Fox think News. We think exactly. he's fantastic. We want, we want to know that fantastic guy who we saw on Fox News' opinion of academic freedom. <laughs> well, this is what I think is really insulting to you, Thunderfoot. Uh, the doors were thrown open for Ben Stein, but shut for you. What does that say about your intellect? <laughs> well, I can't diss Thunder too much because upon arrival, where our ratings have jumped over well over 900, and... Um, it is at this time I've been strongly advised that we uh, push for donations. Thank you, Thunder, for bringing a massive crowd in your wake. And that we are now over 14,000, I'm glad to say. We've been sitting at under 13,000 until 30 minutes ago. PZ, I'm sure you were responsible for some of that, uh, some of that rise. Thank you, Thunder, for bringing in a crowd. And Thunder can't hear me. Uh, uh, talking about the Discovery Institute, have you had any uh, run-ins with them yourself? Oh no, I've I've never not not directly. I mean, I've I've done a lot of blogs blog stuff on on their nonsense, but um, you know, there there have been a few people I've met from the Discovery Institute. I've met uh, Michael Behe, who's a pompous twit. Um, well, you just you just answered the question I was about to ask. I was going to say, what's he like in real life? Is he that bad? Oh no, you know, I I I had lunch with him. He was polite. He was who, who civil. Up the tab? He was friendly. Uh, let's see. This was oh, actually, this this was he was at an invited invited speaker at Temple University and so I think the Temple University philosophy department actually paid for it for mine too so it was okay um, now he's you know the thing is he's so full of himself he, he really does think he has made a majestic immense discovery with irreducible complexity and he will not listen to you if you point out to him that this is this is a concept that's been known for a long time and it's no barrier to evolution and and his entire idea is nonsense but I'm, I'm, what, what I find, I'm sorry our new first um, um, yeah but the, I mean the whole Dover Kitzmiller thing was the argument that there, there was no other explanation and this was refuted and it was refuted clearly and it was refuted with every one of their arguments from coagulation to the 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 the, the, blood, the I mean, the, yes. the, the stupid flagellum, every argument they had, why do these people never admit any error? I mean, this often happens with me when I, when I, I, I try to focus one person down on one point. You know, you get people like Nephilim Free that want to argue everything in the spectrum so that they can freely jump from corner to corner to corner as need be. But if you focus on one point and get them to prove one point and, and show them that, okay, here we are, several hundred examples of transitional species with you know according to the strict right. definition and all that you will never get an admission that any of them actually meet that criteria or if on the rare occasion that you do because i did encounter once where somebody admitted that there were such things they also admitted that you could they also stated that you cannot tell people that you can't teach students that because you can't allow them to believe that this was somebody that was According to the Texas really? Board of Education, yes, he actually said that in a public moderated debate. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. He admitted there were some, but he wanted to teach that there were none because you can't let students believe that. That was, that was in an open. One, yeah, one rationale I've heard for the, for that particular position, you can see to the Creation Museum too. They actually advocate a kind of hyper evolution, 
but it's all changes within a kind. So yes, you can find transitional fossils within a kind, but you will not find transitional fossils between kinds. Where what, kind like fuck a duck. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, PZ, it's awfully rude of me, um, but uh, however many transitional fossils you'll find, what you're actually doing is actually not plugging one gap, you're creating two. So they'll yeah. say, well, you've got nothing between A and uh, B, but then you say, ah, oh, actually, we've got A1. A1, B. So they'll say, oh, no, but hang on, you haven't got anything between A and A1 and A1 and B. So you can't win with these people, can you? And, and, and then you can't get a definition of kind unless you get somebody that wants to sound very scientific and use the term barriman, oh. wherein they try to use the family, the, tax, the, the typical taxonomic classification of family, forgetting, of course, that the family hominidae includes humans along with all other apes. And I, and, and I don't know how their, their argument is, is padded against that reality. They're expecting well, people not to know that. Right. It's, it's an infinitely fluid argument. Um, you know, if you, if you go to the Creation Museum and you look there, they are very concrete about it, that all these other species went through this microevolutionary radiation, okay, that there was lots of evolution going on with other species. But they have, you know, they, I've, I've got some examples of these wonderful diagrams from them where there's, there's branchiness for all these other species, except for humans. Humans, straight line from Adam to us, no change ever. So they're very specific there. <laughs> so that's, that's one argument. Uh, then you look at people like uh, Michael Behe and, you know, his last book, the name the title of it escapes me, but it was it was a very peculiar book where he argues that there is a barrier to evolution between of, of a certain level and um, he's, he's not very specific there except in a few places where at, at one point he says, okay, families that you know what we call a taxonomic family is uh, is about the limit of variation that you can get and nothing else beyond that. But then the entire point of his book is that you can't have more than two mutations involved in any particular trait or it's mathematically impossible to achieve it. Two required mutations. Um, and he gave his, his, his chief example was um, malaria and resistance to anti-malarial agents where he's he claims that all oh, it requires these two particular mutations for the malarial parasite to have this, and if you look at the math, it doesn't work. So, if you if you take that perspective, then we're we're getting something very narrow. That's that's a much narrower range than the family. That's that's saying that the variation we we see within a species is physically impossible. Within a so, protein, you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> If I may, PC, um, you talked about Behe and uh, in particular his obsession with the intelligent design of the bacteria flagellum. I think this is a really odd choice for a, 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 a obviously a, a Christian and God-loving person to use as an example of God's great design. How many deaths has that caused? Oh, this is, this is one reason you do not see Behe's last book cited by the creationists very much. Because I, I will say this for Behe, he's very honest there, and he's up front about it. And he says flatly that malarial resistance, or the resistance of malaria to anti-malarial agents, was specifically put there by an intelligent designer. And he's very free about saying this up front. But yes, what this tells us is that all of these innovations, including the ones that are harmful to human beings, were the particular specific creations of a deity. Well, I have to admire his honesty. I wasn't aware of it. Yes. So his, oh, yes. his, his, his uh, well, I'm presuming it's his uh, Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh created he doesn't say, he doesn't swans say and syphilis, I guess, the best way you yes. can put it. No, he says he says intelligent designer. That he doesn't say doesn't come out and say God, but you know Michael B. He is a Catholic, and it's it's clearly a God he's thinking about. But he's he's very upfront about this. He says no, all this, all these novelties, all these, you know, um, uh, antibiotic resistance. That's God's work. 
Wow. This is God punishing us. I'm, I'm aware of the time. I just want to, again, very briefly allow uh, you and Aaron to have an exchange in, in relation to this, because recently Aaron, uh, on the Magic Sandwich Show, was having a conversation with a creationist, a well-known creationist on YouTube, and the question that was asked was, how many cats did Noah take onto the ark? Aaron, do you want to explain? <laughs> Uh, Are they we had, clean or unclean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had Venom Fang X on once upon a time. We were uh, compared arguments. And he wanted to accuse me of lying. And uh, he, he said that, and I, I challenged him on that, of course, and he said that where I had lied was in a video that I'd made about feline evolution, wherein I asked how many cats were on the ark, and he thought that that question required me to assume a different answer than what the question actually was asking for. So that his false assumption is where he thought I was lying. But anyway, uh, I asked him to, to express for me, and it goes back to the, the phylogeny challenge, the video that I talked to you about in, in Ireland and that you featured at that time. Um, the funny thing is that there was a cool story about that with uh, Richard Dawkins later when he saw that, but I'll tell you later. Anyway. I asked Venom Fang to identify this Behrman, this this related family. What is what is created? What is related? So, how does this relate to cats? How many cats did Noah take on the ark? And Venom Fang kept refusing to answer the question. Any kind of bullshit answer he could come up with until he just started randomly throwing numbers out of his ass. Uh, to be because, fair, Owen, it was worse than that. Uh, his initial response is, um, I know why you're asking that question, to which I was saying, well, the reason that he's asking the question is irrelevant to the answer. Will you please answer it? And he said, I will. And it was about 10 or 15 minutes. And eventually he said, okay, it's between one number and another number. <laughs> <laughs> but more telling than that was when, uh, when he said something about uh, that birds did not uh, evolve from dinosaurs and humans did not evolve from apes. And I said, well, why is it then that birds are still dinosaurs now and humans are still apes now? And somehow, or I think he actively avoids all my videos because uh, Benefiting X has never acknowledged my existence previously until we actually spoke on that one episode of The Magic Sandwich. He'd never acknowledged me at all. But then... I hit him with this argument. He'd never heard it before, and he wanted clarification of one thing before he would admit that the definition of apes applied to humans and that the definition of dinosaurs applied to birds. He wanted to make sure, before he answered that question, whether or not he could still believe in creationism if that were a fact. We said, oh, yeah, sure, why not? And he said, oh, okay, well, then I accept it. Okay. Yeah. So did, did they initially come out with eventually come out with the answer of six or something? Ten. But, yeah, ten. ten. Because, again, there's no thought, and ten wasn't even one of the available options. Based well, on I think I think your response to that um, was absolutely fantastic, and if I remember it right, I probably will misquote it. It was, I didn't think you'd answer that question. I wasn't it wasn't expecting you to roll the dice and pick out of your. And I thought you were I, honestly I, for a family show. I thought you were going to say ask but you said back pocket any number that you like but i mean this is the, the the great thing that they can do isn't it they you know everything is untestable um everything is untestable that's and, a very and, good and the problem is of course that there is no way of disproving the fact that god could have actually have caused everything to have been created and appear to have an older age so you know they've always got this cop out but no anyway. there have been a few times just, just to briefly change the subject, PZ, uh, how many times have you been to the Creation Museum? Just once. Wasn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you serve your penance well, sir. <laughs> it's um, not like you take the family every summer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Only when they've been bad. <laughs> um, so, I've heard that they've like, got some huge fence and attack dogs there and armed security guards to keep the extremist Muslims are, is that right? Oh, they brought them out for us atheists. Oh, wow. Yeah, so when we went through there, they had... Get off the dinosaur, sir! Get off the dinosaur! <laughs> I, I think, um, I think they had a right, PC. Um, can you tell us about the, the rules that they impose about uh, having sex on the um, exhibits? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they were very concerned that we were going to uh, 
commit various obscene acts in their museum and I don't know make it unclean or something and uh, we actually had to sign a contract before we went in that said you know that we'd behave ourselves that uh, that we wouldn't destroy anything like we were planning to um, and that we wouldn't have gay sex on any of the exhibits now, there's there's another thing about that whole morality argument you know you have all these Christians would tell me throughout my life that if it wasn't for their belief in God that they would run amok in the streets raping and killing everyone they meet and just you know randomly hurting everyone and I'm like I, really it's it's your belief in God is the only thing that makes you act like a normal human being is that really it and so which of us then is actually moral because I don't do that without belief in all of that. And I can't imagine Carl Sagan running amok, raping and killing people, but at the same time, statistically, where do we get all of our violent crimes? Where do we get, you know, look at the drug addiction, look at uh, a, a, a sexual molestation of children, not just in the Catholic Church, but in general. You know, when right. you look statistically, the more religious people are, the more inclined they are to child abuse of various forms. Statistically, religion loses on all the moral fronts. You know, I mean, we atheists may have a higher tolerance of pornography or, or profanity, and that's about the extent of our immorality, it seems, that and Thunderfoot and I will drink in front of camera. Apart from that, that's about as bad as we get. <laughs> T, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is one of the. Just, so, just we, so you uh, know, guys, I I am now in full Jesus garb. Um, <laughs> this is how. So I'm visiting one of these religious antagonists sort of chaps over here in Idaho, and uh, yeah, we went shopping at Home Depot early for a crucifix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, nice. oh, the second one is the second one is. Hang on, one second. But this is this is one of the issues that we actually discussed on the Magic Summit in uh, Dublin. Oh, sorry, I thought you'd gone to answer the phone. Sorry, Thunder. This is a genuine application for a job in a Christian bookstore. So I went into a Christian bookstore just like this, and well, I need a job, and all the carpentry jobs have been outsourced to China. So, uh, you know, <laughs> all, I, know, all I know, all I know, I had to sign my for you. you know? Sorry, I, I got to say. As great an honor as it was to combat Islamist extremists beside P.Z. Myers, I, I, I think it would be equally amusing to browse a Christian bookstore beside Thunderfoot. <laughs> we, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all, all four of us have to make a field trip to some common Christian bookstore and hit, and hit the place <laughs> off. We need, we need to have with us palm leaves to lay before him as he walks this, in. This is... This is another challenge, right, is to actually go into somewhere like Borders and move all of the Bibles to the fiction section. Yeah, thunder. Thunder. <laughs> we, we can get a little sort of beeline going where you pass them one to the next, you know. Oh, yeah. Where do you intend or, or we to can, be? You, know, you, you open them up and put the sticker in the front, you know, all the characters in this book are fictional and any resemblance to people, livings or dead, is purely coincidental. Uh -huh. Thunder, where do you intend to be in three weeks' time? Oh... Uh, that's a tough question. I'm not sure. Why don't you plan um, to be in Houston? Uh, Houston's oh, yeah. a long way out of the way. That's like 2,000 miles out of the way or something. I could do it, but... but it's I, it's the big convention. Richard Dawkins will be there. I'll be there. You I'll be there. there. I'll be there. Oh. I'll be there. I'll be there. I didn't get an invitation. Um, can I just say uh, very briefly, uh, Kirk, I know that you're on next. Uh, I suspect that Lacey Green is not going to be available, so um, you are going to have the opportunity, uh, opportunity to overrun. So please forgive us if we carry on for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, we will be coming to you soon. Yeah, just wait. We're busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you haven't been to Houston, Thunder, I can tell you, you will genuinely love that place. They have one of the buildings, one of the main buildings downtown has a gigantic oh. cross on it. They're, they, I was while about to say, we, can't, can't, we, can't we do something like crush one of the mega churches? No, no, hang on now. They, they, I mean, they really have mega churches now. While we're trying our best to raise a few thousand dollars for a worthwhile charity that does real work, there are churches in Houston that are raising millions 
to erect mm. useless crosses, which essentially on either side of the town on the freeway, which stand for little more than you know the scent of urine marking their territory. Two hundred foot useless crosses that have to have lights on top so that airplanes don't crash into them. This is what they're raising money for. And they have one of their main buildings downtown has a giant cross mounted on it. And they have a mega church there that is bigger than the stadium, that is three times bigger than the stadium in Melbourne, Australia, where they will be holding the Global Atheist Convention. And that's a church. Come on, yeah. how could you pass um, up a trip like that? Well, um, can we just, um, just dealing with a similar issue, um, is there any update on the news of the Noah's Ark theme park, um, whether they've actually managed to get the finance to put that together? No, but that's $150 million, quite one, quite one of a billion dollars. Um, yeah, the only other... I mean, damn, um, that, that, that's like what England costs, you know? Yeah. Now, think about it in this... Let's look at it in a different scale, okay? When Christians want to solve problems, and I normally don't isolate Christians, but we are talking about Texas here. Um, when Christians want to sort out problems, they have big prayer meetings, and they charge for parking and rake in money. Okay, And then they don't do anything but wish that things would be better. Okay, When we're talking about Doctors Without Borders, we're talking about a real response. We're talking about something that's real word, that real world, that really works. And how many Christians have we had involved in this charity thus far? I've had threats of two. And I haven't uh, seen I, either I, one I, show I, up. I, I, to be fair, I don't think that's a, um, a fair criticism. Um, the reason that this has an atheist uh, appearance to it is that's the sort of people I know and the people I like and the people I want to be on the show. Uh, yes, there are certain... Um, theists that I did invite onto the show, uh, in particular Ray Comfort, who ignored my requests, your requests, and Superfly's requests, um, but I, I, the, the charity does not discriminate on any basis, and I would be, I, I know we've touched upon certain things, but I don't want to be um, overtly anti-theist uh, in support of a charity that does not make that discrimination. Okay, fair. Uh, there, there's my hand you may slap it by the way <laughs> uh, those of you who heard my phone go off that was Matt Dillahunty who was listening on the show and wanted to call to remind Thunderfoot that he also will be in Houston there you go <laughs> it's the place to be yes I, I, I can't but help feel a little peer pressure here you know <laughs> Are we going to go through who's got who's got the biggest um, phone sort of like I mean who who have I got on my phone? Oh oh I've got Matt Devante as well. Oh oh I actually I, I honestly I I, I swear uh, I absolutely pat myself the other day because my phone suddenly lit up and AC Grayling was calling me and it was like I don't know what to say. I'm so frightened. He'll be on the show in a few hours' time, everyone. But uh, yes, and and not at all, not at all to put DPR down. I I love and respect DPR a great deal, but he did have to call me to ask me to call Matthew, Matthew Chapman. Chapman. You can't even remember his name. <laughs> I was pausing for effect. Okay, I wanted to make sure I didn't say Michael Chapman again. <laughs> I can't believe we've got three stupid YouTube people uh, trying to boast about how big their um, phone address book is when we've got PC Myers on the show sitting quietly and patiently with a confused <laughs> look on his face thinking, why the fuck did I agree to come on this show? I apologize for my no, it's okay. arrogant friends. Uh, I, 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 would, I would bring out my iPhone but I, and show you a few names, but I don't want to crush you. No, you know, that's what, that is exactly what PZ did to me in Dublin. I mean, he very smirky, by the way. He said, "I was oh, I could talk I mean, to exactly what you're talking about." He was. He said, "I can talk to I can talk to Dawkins anytime yeah. I want to." He's in myself. <laughs> and he, he actually, you know what? You know, he actually sat there in front of us, typing onto his computer, and we knew that he was 
messaging Richard Dawkins. It was like, <laughs> what's the email address? And he, yeah. <laughs> I went right off him at that point. <laughs> well, I, right. I, I, I have to admit, I lost my mobile phone. Over 1,000 viewers. But my we, phone we got got thousand Actually, uh, you're quite right, Aaron. Uh, for those that have just come along and those that are joining us, um, this is a 24-hour show uh, in support of Doctors Without Borders, Maison Sans Frontières. If you have come here by chance and you're enjoying the show, please take an opportunity to go on to one of those uh, things above the, um, uh, the video thing. First giving, just giving make a donation, or alternatively, also go to eBay. We haven't done the eBay thing. We have not even mentioned anything on eBay yet. But yes. um, if you're, if you're confused at all about what it is that we're trying to raise money for, go to my YouTube channel, A-R-O-N-R-A, -R -R -A, uh, at yeah, YouTube. Look at the video, 24 Hours for Doctors Without Borders. Watch that video, and you will feel proud to be involved just being supportive of this group. Please make a donation. And Thunder has left the room. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, um, there is a um, conference going on. Uh, do you want to talk about that a bit more? Three weeks' time, did you say, in Houston? Houston, it's a free thought conference, yes. <coughs> uh, Richard Dawkins, yourself, the Texan Tank. Um, how do people get to know about it? Where should they go to? It's also a, it's a combined event this year. It's American, uh, it's uh, Atheist Alliance of America is their national convention being held in the same venue. It's the Hyatt Regency, very nice hotel, one of those uh, sky restaurants that rotate around to the top. Uh, I'm going to be presenting, I believe, in the, uh, Imper well, Michael Shermer, at least, will be presenting in the Imperial Ballroom while I simultaneously may be running the Magic Sandwich show in one of the adjoining rooms. Uh, it's going to be a huge crowd, it's going to be great fun, and it's going to run for at least two days. A lot of, lot of good speakers, Matt Chapman. Most of the hosts, of, most of the, uh, the, the people that were on this show today will be there in that venue. So if you like everybody you saw here, go there. Well, there's, mm -hmm. a, few, there's a few yet to come, but uh, what's the Magic Sandwich show? <laughs> sorry, sorry, PZ. Oh, I, I, I have to sorry, admit, PZ I can't... wants to say something. I, I'm totally okay, bad no, no, no. at interrupting. So, PZ, you want to say something? Oh, okay. no, no, go ahead. Plug, plug your shows. It's fine. I'll... I, I, I'm telling <laughs> you. Okay, no, 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 let me come in briefly here. I can't compete with any of you with a mobile phone thing because my mobile phone got lost, stolen, whatever. So it's gone. There's no backup. Um, but, PZ, you might recognize these. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I might not have a mobile phone with, like, all these superstars' names in, but what I do have is communion wafers and wine. Okay. PZ, do you want to... Uh, Jesus it's Christ! It's a that I was not familiar with. Do you want to, do you want to talk us through your uh, experience with communion wafers and the consequences of what you did? Oh, it was very silly, though. I mean, this was ridiculous. I, I desecrated a communion wafer, a consecrated communion wafer. I threw it in the trash with a nail in it. And people got very upset for some strange reason. I do not understand why. It was a cracker in the trash, and somehow this was big news. Well, yeah. I mean, what, what were the consequences? What were the repercussions for you? Was it just bad publicity or were there sort of like... Oh, the, sort of the repercussions were that I got a tremendous amount of traffic on my blog. I got this extra lump of money from all these people flooding into my blog. And I went out and bought a big screen TV with it. So that, <laughs> that was the only re repercussion I can think of. Now, I can tell you that the biggest screen TV I have ever seen was at the, the Feltz's place. So I stopped by them um, on the way over here. It was colossal. I've never seen such a big TV. So um, yeah. God also pays well. <laughs>